I think you'll be able to see it. I like this light out the bird. Yeah, yeah, it's something that I added. Uh, once I know what it is, yeah. just to give people an idea. It's not on every slide, it's just on the beginning because it's way too much effort to update it. But I do have a slide number at the... That's a slide for two to the slides. So. Yeah. <clears throat> Give or take. I don't need that Are you guys still making it? Last year we did? Yeah. Where's that camera? Right there. Yeah. Here am I. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, for those folks out there watching the live stream, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Brian K. Bagnini, and I'm the director of training for developertraining.io, as well as the uh, full, the principal developer, full stack developer for 6 Gen 3, and most recently, um, I landed a job as an enterprise application developer for First Commerce Credit Union, so I'm very excited about that. Tonight, we're going to be talking about intro to JavaScript. The previous code talks was dealing with um, modern web design, and so I thought this would be a nice follow-up to it as, as a part of that. So... <clears throat> What we'll be talking about tonight is what is JavaScript, how to download and use JavaScript, overview of popular frameworks and libraries, and then an overview of the JavaScript language itself. So that is the plan. <clears throat> so what is JavaScript? Uh, well, let's start with what it's not. Um, it's not Java, for one, uh, despite the the, the name is similarity. It's not actually Java. Those are two completely separate languages. JavaScript is sometimes referred to as ECMAScript. Uh, so you may see something that, uh, you know, ECMA script, that's, they're talking about JavaScript. Sometimes they shorten it to, e, uh, to ES. It's the same difference though. Uh, it's a dynamic, loosely typed, interpreted scripting language. And I know that that is a mouthful. That's okay. Um, we'll take it bit by bit. So, dynamic loosely typed means that it, when you're declaring a variable, you don't have to declare what type of data is going to go in that variable. And that's nice. Some other languages are very rigid about that, and you actually have to, to be more verbose, more, much more gender specific. So, JavaScript is a little loosey-goosey on that. And it's like, you know what, I'll figure out what type of data it's supposed to be and, de and go accordingly. Uh, it is an interpreted scripting language, which means that if you want to go make a change to it, you can go make a change and go refresh your browser, and you don't have to compile anything. With other programming languages, th there's an intermediary step where you have to compile it down to then see whether or not it's going to work correctly. So <clears throat> this is nice. And it's a great starter language to, to, to really kind of start into the world of programming. It was created by Netscape back in December of 1995, which is about six years after the birth of the commercial internet. Although realistically, I don't think it, the internet, the commercial internet really became mainstream until maybe the early to mid nineties, <clears throat> at least it didn't for me. So JavaScript has been around almost from the very, very beginning, which is kind of nice. Of course, Netscape is gone, but that's okay. <clears throat> it is what it is. So where does JavaScript fit into web design? Well, if you think about a web page like a three-legged stool, you really have to have three components to make it work. One, you need HTML5. That's going to provide the structure of the site. This is basically the actual content that you're going to see. Um, think about this like if a web page was a house, the HTML5 is the walls. I want a wall here, I want a half wall over here for the kitchen so that I have a little bar area. So that's what HTML5 does. CSS3 is all about presentation. It's the style and position of the site. What does it look like? So this is, in a, continuing with our house analogy, this is 
akin to, I want a red front door and I want green shutters and I want the walls to be painted fuchsia because I have no sense of style whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> and I'm never ever going to sell my house ever again. Um, and then JavaScript is the interactivity part. So this is interacting with our client, our, our user that's browsing on our website. This deals with behavior. So this is akin to a smart thermostat like one of those Nest thermostats that's programmable and it's smart and it figures out what your patterns are when you're there and when you're not. That's kind of what JavaScript is. This provides some of the, some of the wow factor. <clears throat> so what can we do with JavaScript? We can select and add elements, attributes. We can select text from HTML. We can replace all of those things. We can respond to specific events on the page and we can modify the content, which makes this really cool. That gives it the dynamic part. So I'm sold. I got to get me some of this. Where do I go to download this? Here's the good news. We don't have to. There's nothing to download if you want to work with JavaScript. All you need is a web browser and your machine comes with at least one. Whether that's Edge or Internet Explorer on Windows or Safari on, on the Mac, and then you use that browser to go download a good browser like Firefox or Chrome or whatever else. You know, but the good news is you have a browser and it supports JavaScript right out of the gate and you can go and start doing things in JavaScript immediately. So there is nothing to download. However, if you want to run JavaScript on the server, if you want to run it on your local machine and have it do some things, <clears throat> you can do that, but you do need to download a package called Node.js. So we have the URL right here. It's Node.js.org. Uh, and we're speaking English, so we'll, we'll go with the English language version. <clears throat> so to use JavaScript, there's several different ways we can do this. We're going to start with the easiest and then kind of pr go progressively harder from there. We can log messages to the console. And I'll, I'll break out of the slide deck in a second and show you what that actually looks like. It's kind of cool. You can do an alert. Don't do an alert. Alerts are like pop-ups. Nobody likes pop-ups. So this is one of those, you can do this, use very, very, very sparingly. Really make sure this is something you need to interrupt their, their browsing session with. A lot of times what we're gonna do is go take and write something to our HTML page. And so this is with document.write. And then, and this is the cool part, we can actually replace pieces of text so we can have a generic piece of text on the page. And then if certain conditions exist, JavaScript can replace that text with other text, other elements, other things. So this is really, really exciting. And this is done with document.getElementById. So in this example here, we're looking for an ID with the name of some text and what we're gonna replace, whatever that is with is with this is JavaScript. So here's what the HTML page actually looks like that this goes in. <clears throat> so here's a basic HTML file. And there's a couple of places that we can use JavaScript. One place is that we can insert it right into the HTML page in between these two script tags. And then whatever we put up there will run somewhere down in the page, uh, depending on what we have it do. We can also, and this is a more common way of working with JavaScript, is to put all the JavaScript in a separate file, a .js file, and then just make a reference to that. And this is much, much easier, especially if you're working with a team and you're going to be dealing with some of the interactivity and you've got a graphic designer that's dealing with some of the style elements and you've got people that are the actual subject matter experts that are dealing with the actual content, you can stay out of each other's hair because your graphic designer is going to be dealing with the CSS file that is a separate file. You're going to be dealing with the JavaScript file and the subject matter experts are going to be dealing with the HTML and everybody's happy. At least that's the plan anyway. So we have an ID here on this paragraph text that is some text and the text that it says currently before the JavaScript runs is this is HTML. All right. So this is actually what it looks like. 
well, that is really daunting when it uh, <clears throat> flips out of that. So this is what this file looks like. And I just opened this file in, the, in Firefox, and it says this is HTML. All right, cool. Here is my hello world. So this is my pop-up alert that is annoying because now I can't do anything else in the window without it. Then when I go click on that to clear out that alert, what happens is this is HTML gets replaced with this is JavaScript. So it's already working. It's already in action. Um, what about our console, though? That's kind of weird. We didn't, we didn't really see that. So if we right click on any web page and go to inspect, in Chrome, it shows up on the right-hand side. In Firefox, it's at the bottom. Same difference. These are some of the developer tools. And we have a console right here. And this is where our hello console, that console.log message went right here. So this is probably the easiest way to go play with it and see what it's going to do before you actually start writing to the HTML page. And it's very easy to simply replace console.log with document.write. So this is how that actually happens. And some of the interactivity that we were talking about is actually right here. So I have a button here that's green currently. It says, click me. Now, normally, your IT people are going, dear God, no, don't do that. <laughs> but I made this, so it's OK. It's safe. If I hover over it, it changes color to purple. That's not an accident. That's nothing but JavaScript. Now, the truth of the matter is we can do these types of things with CSS. But we can also do it with JavaScript. Um, but notice the time right here. So the time on my local machine is, uh, it's military time, so it's 1811 hours and 50 seconds. And if I click me, I reload the page, because that's what this does. And it changed to 1800 hours, 11 minutes and 27 seconds. And if I click again, it's going to reload the page again. And we still continue to get that that other thing. So <clears throat> that is JavaScript in action. All right. So I'll go back to the slides because it's a little easier to, um, to see the code that way versus in the code view. So there we go. Oh, seriously? All right, no big deal. Back again. All right. So there was our HTML, there was our some text, and we saw that it changed, and that is very, very cool. So how exactly is JavaScript doing this? Well, one of the things that it does is that it makes changes to, to what's called the DOM, which stands for Document Object Model. So what we have here is a document, sometimes called a window, and inside of that document, this is within our web browser, We've got our HTML tags. So we started with the HTML tag, and we're probably not going to do much with that tag, but we could do things like change the title of the page using JavaScript, depending on what happens. We can certainly change links. So I've got a link here for a style sheet, and maybe we go change this. So if you're used to working with applications and you're like, oh man, I sure wish this had dark mode, this is how they're doing that. This is it, this is all they're doing, is they've got another style sheet for dark mode, and there's a little bit of something, most likely JavaScript, that is capturing that and figuring out what choice you, you made. And, that's, and then it flips it to that other style sheet. So this is how it works. You can go in and change uh, paragraph tags, heading one tags, all sorts of things. So this is just a tiny little teaser for the document object model and pretty much where we're going to end our conversation on that. But you can see it's where it's at. It's at developer.mozilla.org, which is where the folks that used to work at Netscape went to. Mozilla is the creator of Firefox. So they are pretty much the definitive source. So one of the other things we have is frameworks and libraries. And you're going, yeah, you know, I've seen a lot of these in these job ads, and um, they, they want me to know React, or they want me to know jQuery, they want me to know this. Why should I learn JavaScript when all I need to do is just go learn these frameworks or libraries? All right? There's a couple of reasons. But first, what's the difference? So framework <clears throat> makes you 
run through the paces of creating an application and not giving you a whole lot in the way of choices along the way. They've got some predefined ways that they do things and you kind of have to play along with their rules. So this is kind of like you go to a builder and you say, hey, I want to buy, I, I, I've got a plot of land and I want to build a house. And he's like, great, awesome. Here's four house plans. Which one do you want? And you're like, mm, I'll take that one. He says, great. And he gives you some choices on picking out the appliances and picking out the, you know, the countertops and that sort of thing. But otherwise, that's really much it. If you want to change this wall, knock this wall out, put a half wall in, or double French doors instead of the sliding, like, you can forget that. That's that's he's not going to do that, right? So frameworks can be somewhat limiting, but they are incredibly useful because they do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So that's the advantage. Libraries, on the other hand, are little chunks of code that are for very specific things. And the nice part is, is that you can incorporate as many or as few as you want. So <clears throat> React especially, you can use as little React as you want or as much React as you want, along with other things. So you can include React in alongside another framework. Um, so these are some of the bigger ones. You know, React is very popular because Facebook actually created that. So it's not going anywhere. Uh, on the framework side, AngularJS isn't going anywhere because that is Google's creation. And they both kind of work in the same fashion. Um, slight differences. Vue is the new kid on the block for that category of, of framework or library. Uh, there's some other ones. ElectronJS is really cool. Um, if you have ever used something like Slack and went, wow, it looks the same on my Mac as it does on my PC at work. There's a re reason why. It's created in Electron.js. So they use JavaScript to build desktop applications. It's very, very cool. I was actually today playing with a new one called Feathers that is even more streamlined towards making applications real-time chat applications and making APIs, dead simple, nothing to it. The tutorial is so simple. Um, so there's other libraries, some charting things, some three-dimensional graphics things. Node.js is huge, although technically it's a runtime, but basically it allows you to run JavaScript on the local machine. And so this is how they're doing server-side JavaScript. And that's really nice. So Node is a really popular one. <clears throat> But why would I go to the trouble of learning JavaScript when all I got to do is go learn these libraries, right? Well, here's the reason why. These libraries are written in JavaScript. So if you got to dig into the weeds for something, and that's going to come up at some point, it helps to understand the underlying JavaScript. At least have some exposure. You don't have to be an expert at it, but at least have some sort of exposure to it. So that's the value of that. The second reason is that sometimes it's easier just to write a little bit of vanilla JavaScript to accomplish what you need. Do you really need this big bloated library to go download to every user's phone to do one thing, right? That's crazy. About five years ago, 60% of the internet went down, got shut down because all of these big sites were using this guy's library and he decided, that's it, I'm done. He's out. I'm out of here. And he quit supporting his thing and he took it out and it broke the internet, quite literally. And the, and the sad part is, is it was maybe 20 lines of code to go keep you from having to go write maybe a half dozen lines of code in JavaScript. That's all this, that's all this library did. So sometimes you can over rely on libraries. The best guidance for use, whether, whether or not to use a library or a framework is does it solve a significant problem and if it does then it makes sense to go to go deal with it and if it doesn't then just go write vanilla javascript and be done with it and that's exactly what i'm doing in my new job we're working with a software development kit and the way we interact with it is either with python or with javascript none of these frameworks it's all pure vanilla python pure vanilla javascript so that's why, we, that's why we go to the trouble learning some of it. So without further ado, <clears throat> let's go take a look at some of the components of the JavaScript language. 
So we'll take a look at variables and how to make comments and arrays and how to do control statements, some conditional logic. And no, this is not a typo. I didn't leave the A out. That's not Jason. Although I have a friend named Jason. Although he doesn't spell it that way. Um, I didn't spell it this way either. <laughs> but this is JSON. And it's JavaScript object notation. We'll talk about some classes and events. Events are the cool parts. Um, and some of those data types. So we don't quite get away from it, but there we go. One thing, um, and I'll have the link at the end, but all the, the slide deck and the source code for all of these, all this code that you're about to see is actually on a GitHub repo. And it is, I'll, I'll give you that link at the, at the end. It's pretty easy to, uh, to, to find and get to. Within the slide deck, in the lower right corner, I had to think about it, it's been a long day, but in the lower right corner, I've got a file name there, and that's where you'll find that code sample. So that, if that, if that helps out some. All right, <clears throat> so let's start with our basic building blocks of any sort of programming, and that is a variable. So how do we declare a variable? Well, we need a keyword, and then we need to give it the variable some sort of a name. So here we're going to use our keyword of var or let or const. And there are some differences. That's what the nice pretty graphic is for. Um, but those are our keywords. So we're telling JavaScript, hey, I've got a variable coming up. Pay attention. It's going to be called name. And this is the contents of it. So in this case, it's a text string. And then we put a semicolon at the end of the statement. And that's how JavaScript knows that there is that we've hit the at the end of the statement. If you omit that semicolon, if it's the very last statement, no harm, no foul. But if you add something after that, then JavaScript is going to get really confused and your results may vary widely. So just get in the habit at the end of the statements, put a semicolon and you'll be fine. So that's one of those, that's part of that syntax rules. So a variable is nothing more than just a, a location in memory. And an easy way to think about a variable is it's a box. It's a box that I'm going to put a piece of data into, right? Just one piece of data. And in this case, this piece of data is the name Brian. All right. We have the ability to make comments in our code, and commenting is very important. I wish more people did it. It'd make life a whole lot easier. Um, you'll wish that you had in about six months when you have to go back and make changes and you're going to be like, what idiot wrote this? And you're like, oh, wait, that was me. So comments are your friend. I heard one person express comments as the comments are <clears throat> the human language way of solving the problem because that's all code is, is solving problems. And the code is to explain the comments to the computer. And when you think about it like that, it makes a lot more sense. In reality, we use comments to explain the code to us humans. Um, so we can put comments in. We have two kinds of comments, single line and multi-line. Single line comments are done with two forward slashes. And any place that JavaScript interpreter sees those two forward slashes, it immediately ignores everything to the end of that line. So I can put a comment at the end and explain what this piece of code does. That's useful. If I put it at the beginning of it, in the second example, JavaScript is going to ignore that line of code. And this is also useful. Yay, spam calls. Sorry. <clears throat> I get inundated with them. So JavaScript, is the interpreter, is going to ignore that line, and this is very useful, especially when you're really tired of that alert message popping up. You're like, yeah, that was great, and it worked, but uh, I'm done. I'm done with that. So you can go comment that out, and it just, it's like it never happened. Better than erasing it, because if you erase it, and then you needed it back, then, then you gotta go, you gotta go type it back in. Um, Multi-line comments have a forward slash and an asterisk, and then it ends with the reverse of that, an asterisk and a forward slash, and it ignores everything in between. So this is a little more useful for, here's the list of to-dos that you still have to do on this program. 
or this is some of the boilerplate stuff, like, hey, here's how to go use this, here's the problem we were trying to solve with it, or, you know, I like pie, or whatever, you know, pretty much whatever you want to put in there. So that's comments. <clears throat> so it's nice that we can go stick a person's name in there and that we can use that. However, we really want to get stuff from the end user. So the way we do that is with a method called prompt. So we're going to take the, the variable your name and we're going to assign it to whatever the user types in to our prompt, what is your name? Easy enough. Again, every language has its own way of taking in user input. So this is JavaScript and it's pretty straightforward. This is not the only way, by the way, but this is, this is a really easy way. Now, to use that input, well, we're going to go to our trusty friend console.log and we're just going to say hello, comma, and then add your name. So if they put in Billy, it's going to say hello, Billy, and go from there. So this is using uh, concatenation. This top one is concatenation, and I know you're thinking, God, right at 6.30, and yeah, it's been a long day, man. Why you got to use such a $10 word? Concatenation is just a fancy $10 word that means join. We're joining things together. So this is kind of an old school way of doing it, where you have a plus sign in between all of the elements. Um, the new school way is using template strings, and this is really slick. Um, because anywhere you see the dollar sign, and then the braces, the variable will be stuck in between that. Now, this is the gotcha. This is the gotcha for template strings, and they're not playing with this. They use a backtick, not a single quote, but a backtick. For reference, the backtick is below your escape key to the, to the left of the number one. That's where your back tick is. So if you want to use template strings, it's the readability is so much easier. It's much shorter code. However, you got to deal with the stupid back tick. And if you forget that, it was going to break. It's not going to work. So that's that's one of the little gotchas there. So in either case, this is going to return the same thing. It's going to be hello, whatever your name is, or hey, whatever your name is, and all that's going to the console. We have different data types that our variables can be. And this is really useful. So we can have it be a number. So numbers don't have, don't require any single or double quotes around them. We just simply put a number, whether that's 18 or 3.14, doesn't really matter. JavaScript is smart enough to figure out what to do with it and to deal with it. We can have it be a string. We can have it be an object. So an object is kind of interesting. That's what names is. Objects are annotated with uh, braces. So that's the things in red there. Uh, that's sometimes referred to as a dictionary in Python. So if you're coming from Python, dictionary, object, they're the same thing. So that's kind of nice. Um, but this, it uses a, a key of first and last, and then it has a value. So it's a key value pair is the way that that, that works. All right, you can have it be a Boolean. It's named after a mathematician and a, whenever, long time ago, named George Boole. I actually saw a book that said it was, uh, it was invented by a mathematician named George Boolean. And I'm like, oh, no, that's so dead wrong. Somebody didn't fact check that. His name was George Bull. It's called a Boolean after him. So this is basically true or false, and those are your choices. Now, if you put a zero or a one, because zero is false and one is true in most of these cases, but if you put a zero or one, is that a Boolean? No, it's not. It's a number. If you want it to be a Boolean to do something, you have to use true or false. You have to be specific about it. And we'll see this when we get to the logic statements, because that's really where this comes into play. That's, 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 that's where it's useful. We can do an array. So if a variable is like a box, then an array is like the box that you go to the liquor store to get 
It's got the little separators in it so you can put your glasses in so they don't break while you're moving them. Uh, on the house analogy, a variable would be like, here's a house at 123 Main Street, and an array is, here's an apartment building at 123 Main Street. So you can have multiple people living there in that apartment. You can have multiple items in your arrays, but it all goes by the same name which in this case is groceries. Uh, you can have it be undefined. So in all of these data types, except for random here, I have assigned a value to it. If you don't assign a value, and you don't have to, but if you don't assign a value, then its value, its data type, by default, is undefined. JavaScript just doesn't know what to do with it. Once you say, okay, no, random is going to be equal to blah, 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 then it switches from undefined to whatever data type blah, blah, blah is. Then you have null. Now, null is nothing. Null is not just an empty space because a space is a character. So that would be a string. It's not a zero because that is, that's a number. So a null just means nothingness. And I have a friend who, if you make him mad, he doesn't get he doesn't get mad. He just nothings you, like you just cease to exist. I, I love that philosophy. One little side note here: we do have some a slight little bit of vocabulary. We have parentheses, we have braces, and we have brackets, and they are different. They are different things. And a good way to think about it: we know what parentheses look like because we've seen those a lot. Braces. Braces are the squiggly ones. Think about your kid's teeth. They're all crooked and jacked up. So what do you do? You put braces on them, right? So that's the way to remember that. For a bracket, it's at a, you've got right angles there. So if you wanted to put a shelf on the wall, you go to Lowe's or Home Depot and you get an angle bracket to go put your shelf on. So that's the way to think about that. So it does actually matter. Because if you use the wrong type of thing, then your code doesn't work right. Because there's not a lot of difference between groceries here being an array and groceries being a string object with a lot of stuff in it. So it, it kind of matters. One of the vexing things is when you're watching a coding tutorial online and it's itty bitty writing and it's usually in dark mode, which is even harder to read unless it's right there in front of you. And then you're like, wait, is that a parentheses or is that a brace or what is that? Right? They really should blow it up or they should at least sound out what it is. So this is kind of why I do it so big. But a little bit of that there. Uh, we have different methods that we can do with strings. So we have things that we can do with this data. So we're starting with a, 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 a variable called breakfast. And for breakfast today, I had a banana. All right. And notice that I, I changed my keyword. I changed it from var to let. You really should use let more often, but var is okay too. But in this case, I just use let. <clears throat> so one of the things I can do is I can go find out how long that, that text string is. Right. And I can do that with length. Now I'm going to show, I'm going to reveal my gate term here. There have been situations where I've had to go put in, uh, I've had to go put in something like a password or a passphrase or something, and it has to be a certain number of characters. And I'm like, I don't want to count that. So I'd go into my terminal, call up node, and then go do a string, and then do length on the string so it spit out how many characters it was. So we can get the length of things. This is also useful for arrays as well. We can find out how many things are in the array. So really, really useful stuff here. We can slice up that string. In this case, we do have a couple of parameters that we have to add to it. We're starting at position number two and going up to, but not including position number six. So in our case for banana here, that actually returns the word nano. We'll come back to that because I know you're going, wait, I can count. Oh, that's, that's not right. I can count and you can't count. No, I can't. 
it's, it does a little bit something a little different. We can do some replacing, so I can replace the, the letters B A N with one two three, and that gives me one two three N. We can make it be uppercase. This is really useful, all right. And I'll show you a practical example of that a little bit later when we start talking about I think conditional logic. Um, Although I go the other way, I try to put it to lowercase. So this right here, this breakfast and two, that returns the letter N. And you're going, okay, hold on, that's, that's not right. Here's the problem. Computers are a little weird. They start counting indexes, which is just the place of where something is, at zero. So in banana, the B is position zero, the A is position one, the N is position two. And that's going to get you because we learned to count one, two, three, four. We didn't start counting zero. We started with one. Computers start with zero. That is a huge gotcha. If you don't get the results you want, just take one away and you'll be okay. That'll happen about six or 700 times and then it'll burn into your head. We can split out this string and give us an array out of a string. That's useful. What in this case, what it does is it splits on the individual characters. So each letter of our text string banana becomes its own item in the array. In this case, we can do a text string where we've jammed things together. We've said, hey, give me uh, give me some fruits. And they're like, fine, banana, apple, rutabaga. But it's all one text string. Well, they're separated by a comma. They were nice enough to do that for us. So we can do that split method again with a comma this time, and it splits that out into an array where each item is its own thing. So that's kind of useful. So we can take a string and turn it into an array. That's awesome. Fun fact, we can do that with arrays too, going the other way. We can turn an array into a string. So arrays, this time I have fruits, so that's banana, apple, uh, orange, and pineapple. And this is one way to do it, using the brackets. This is a preferred way. There is another way that we can do it, a little more formal kind of way, where you do a keyword new, and then a constructor called array, and then it's in parentheses. But honestly, who wants to type that? Not me. I'll just use the brackets, please. It's much, much easier. So if I want to see the contents of fruits, I can do console.log, and what it does is it spits out what the what that array is banana apple orange pineapple if i go back to my indexing and say well give me what's it value what's an index value number two it says okay fine the counting still works the same so it's zero one two which means i get orange in the third position and not apple in the second position because of that index numbering it's that it's offset by one <clears throat> we can also this is kind of useful if you're troubleshooting something and something doesn't make sense. You can use type of and then point it to the variable. And type of is going to tell you what that data type is. So I actually used that a million years ago because I was taking input from a text box, which is a string, and I was trying to do math on it. You can't do math on strings. It doesn't work do math on numbers. So what I had to do for every one of those was turn that text string into a number. But the way I found out was I used type of, and it told me this user input is a string. And I'm like, it's not supposed to be a string. We typed in a number. So type of is, is, is really, really useful. If I want to turn an array into a string because I need to go do something else with it, maybe some sort of string method, then I use the method to string. Now, you'll notice there's parentheses at the end of to string, and that is important because most methods have parentheses, and if you, if you omit the parentheses, it doesn't work. In some cases, it actually requires you to put something in there, some sort of argument in there or parameter in there, and if you don't, then it yells at you on that too. But it really depends on what to string does. So, arrays are really, really useful. 
we have additional methods on this. We can join things together so we can join items together in that array with whatever separator character we want. We can use pop or push. Pop removes the last item off the list. So if I did this to uh, my fruits array and I showed and I said, give me fruits again, what it would return is banana, apple, and orange. Where, what happened to pineapple? Well, I popped it off. The reason to use this would be that you're going to take whatever the last item is and you're going to do something else with it. So you would use this in conjunction with some sort of variable assignment, like let breakfast be, let breakfast equal fruit stock pop. And now breakfast is going to be pineapple, and then, but it's not on, it's not on the list anymore. All right, push appends an item to the end of the array. So push goes the other way. We're, just, we're going to add something to the end. Well, that's nice. What about the beginning of the array? That's what shift and unshift do. Now, whoever came up with this did really think about this really well because this is not the easiest way to remember which one does what. It's actually sort of backwards. So but they, they weren't thinking about that. They were just trying to make it work. They can't really fault them for that. So all this is nice, but we got to get our code to do something continually. So, so here's the problem. Um, all right, so I have a Swiss Army knife. It is a very useful tool, right? Now, how smart is this tool? It's not smart at all, right? All right, I have a MacBook Air computer. How smart is this tool? Not the same smartness as the Swiss Army knife. It only does what we tell it to do. It does exactly what we tell it to do and nothing more. And nothing is more evident of that than when you start programming. That's when it really becomes apparent. So usually it's the computer doesn't understand the instructions that you gave it. It's not the stupid computer's fault. It's our fault. We didn't explain it well enough. So what the reason we use computers though as a tool is because they are so dead fast. Right? Processor cycles, imagine drawing a circle, a perfect circle, right? How long would it take you to draw a perfect circle? Even if you were an experienced artist, it would take you at least a second to draw one perfect circle. But if you got a four gigahertz processor in your machine, that can draw four billion perfect circles a second. We can't even come close. So the way we get computers to really, the way we maximize the value is by having it repeat things. And that's what looping does. So as you might have guessed, I, I talk a lot. And I did this in class when, you know, when I was in school. And what did our teachers do when we talked a lot in class? What did we do? Right, right. We wrote sentences. And I wrote more than my fair share of sentences. Wish I'd learned about looping back then. I will not talk in class. I will not talk in class. If you were smart, what you did is you went, I, 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 I will, 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 because it was faster, right? This is way faster. We just get the computer to do it easy peasy. So we have a couple of types of loops. The two basic types of loops, there is a do while loop in JavaScript, but the basic loop mechanisms for every language is a while loop or a for loop. We start with the while loop because it's easier to understand. So the first thing we do is we declare a variable, some sort of counter. You can call it num, you can call it i, you can call it j, you can call it billy, you can call it whatever you like, right? And you assign it a value, usually of zero, if you're counting up. Then you say, okay, while, and then you put the condition that you're gonna test for truth. While this condition is true, while num, which is zero, is less than 10. Wait, is zero less than 10? I'm not a math middle giant. Uh, I carry the two. Yes, zero is less than 10. While zero is less than 10, do this stuff in between these curly braces. Execute this code. So in this case, what this loop is doing is saying, hey, remember that number? Take that, increment it by one. All right, so now my number is one. Now take that number and go throw that over in the console because I want to see it. Okay, cool. Now we look back around. So now our number is one. Is one less than 10? Uh, yeah, okay. 
We're going to take that number, increment it by one. Now number is two. We're going to write two in the console. Wash, rinse, repeat. Very fast, of course. Now we get to nine. We get the end of the loop. Nine is less than 10. Increment by one. Write 10 to the thing, to the console. Cool. Now loop back around. Is 10 less than 10? No, it's not. So what happens is the loop has now been the, the, the condition to test for has now tested false. And it breaks out of the loop and goes to the next line. And this is how looping works. This is how all looping works. And if your head's spinning in a loop, don't feel bad. This took me forever to wrap my head around this to get this right. So seriously, don't feel bad at all. For loops sort of compact that. It does the same basic thing, but it does it a little differently. So we use the keyword for, we're going to assign our, our counting variable here. And just to be a little different, I said that we're going to start at 50 instead of zero. And then what it's going to do is go test. Is 50 less than 60? Well, yes, it is. OK, execute that code. Write that number in the console. Then go back to that last little bit here, that num4 plus equals 1. That is, let's go increment that number by one. Same thing that we did in the, in the while loop, but we're just doing it here. So what this is going to do is keep doing that. Same thing happens when it gets to 60, that condition fails and becomes false. 60 is not less than 60. So it drops out of the loop. It skips all of this code and it goes to the next line. Cool. All right, so this is, this is nice theory-wise. How do we use this? Ah, well, you never ask. When we go over here for an array, I've got my array here, uh, fruits. There's my pineapple back again. And what we're going to do is use a for loop and say, all right, i is equal to 0. Now, why did I pick i? Because it's easy to type. You'll see this is very, very common. It doesn't matter what that variable name is called. It's irrelevant. So keep it simple, short and, short and sweet, all right? While i, which is 0, is less than the length of the fruits array, see, now, now we're, we're using that length method, go write out the fruit that is at index value of i. So we get to reuse that number a couple times. It's pretty slick. And then it's going to keep doing that until it runs out of items. And it's going to keep incrementing. That's an important point. On this while loop, it's easier to see in the while loop. What would happen if I didn't have that num plus equals one? What do you think would happen? Keep doing the same thing. Keep doing the same thing, exactly. Because in that case, we said num was zero. Zero is less than 10 last time I checked. Print out zero to the console. OK, loop back around. Wait, num is zero. Zero is less than 10. Print out zero to the console. Loop back around. Num is zero. Zero is less than 10. That's called an infinite loop. So when you're doing a loop, make sure that you have some mechanism for making it evaluate to false. Or you will get an infinite loop. Bottom line. We can use that for loop to add things to an array. So in this case, we started off with an empty array. And what, the, what we're putting in that array is the numbers 0 through 9. And we're using the push method for that array. Because push is going to append, append the number to the end of the array. So this is a, a practical way that we can use the for loops. <clears throat> so the beauty of computers is making decisions for us really fast. We have business logic in everything that we do. We have, there's legal things that we have to do. You know, if you get arrested, they have to read you your rights, else you're going free on a technicality, right? So we've got ways to, to do this. This is our control statements. So I'm going to do a little quiz here. I'm going to get, get an answer from somebody. And that is using a prompt statement, which planet is closest to the sun? And because I'm going to compare their answer with a predetermined answer, 
meaning the right answer to that question, case matters. So the easiest thing to do is I could tell them, hey, when you answer this, make sure it's all in lower case. But really, who's going to get that? It's much easier just to force the point. So I'm using the two lower case method to do that. So now it's going to go check my answer. If the answer that the user provided is equal to the text string mercury, then tell them, hey, that's correct. And if it's not, then tell them they failed third grade science. And they get to try again. So <clears throat> we got an if, we have an else. This is our basic conditional logic, our basic control statements. <clears throat> we can see this a couple of other ways. We've got uh, some other things here. So these two ampersands here, if age is greater than or equal to 25 and age is less than or equal to 35, if that condition is true, then what I want you to say is put, you know, display a message that says target audience. So this is the target audience for a comic book shop. I used to have a roommate way back in the day that owned a comic book shop. And I, one day I said that I said something to him about his demographic being children. And he says, Oh, good, good God, no. Their children aren't my demographic. I'm like, You sell comics, dude. He goes, Yeah, but children are broke. They don't have any money. They got to go beg their parents for it. And the parents are going to be like, No, let's go get in the car. He says, No, my target market, my target demographic is single male 25 to 35. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. Once they get married, their wife won't let them go buy comics anymore. They got to be at least 25 because prior to that, they're too broke to buy comics. Right? It's all disposable income. And past 35, they generally sort of age out of it. So this, he's got a 10-year window here to, to stab these people. <clears throat> so this is the ways that we can do that. So the double ampersands is an and. If we had two straight lines... That's a pipe character. That would be an or statement. And that matters. And means that both conditions have to exist. They have to be greater than 25. They have to be less than 35. You cannot be. And if you get that wrong, you know, you can make it so they're, they're less than 25 and greater than 35. And that's an impossibility. It'll never happen. So make sure you get that right. Um, but the and means that both statements have to be true. If you use an or, either one will suffice. If either one is true, then, then we're good. So we've got our else, and then we have our message, and then we're seeing the results of that. We have a slightly more complicated example of this, and that is... If the weather, we're in a prompt for what the weather's like. And if the weather is sun, then we're going swimming. We have an else if. An else if lets us present another condition that we're testing for. Oh, that's not it? No problem. We have another else if. Here's another condition. Else is always at the end because else is kind of your default, your default behavior, whatever it is you want it to do. That's what you use else for. But everything else, you can use else if. Now, obviously, this can get really lengthy. There's something else called case, but we're not going to go into that. That's supposed to be easier, but honestly, I don't see it. Um, seems to be just as long, in, in all honesty. <clears throat> so this is some of the conditional logic that we can do with this. And this is pretty good. Now, important point for this. You'll notice that we have triple equals. We could also, maybe in some languages, they let you do double equals. But what you don't want to do is a single equal sign. And here's the reason why. Our variable is the word weather. And right now, it's going to be whatever the user put in. So let's say they put in that it was snowing. All right? So weather is equal to snow. And if I go in and I use a single equal sign on my very first if statement, what I am doing is I am assigning weather to be sun. A single equals is an assignment. Double or triple equals is comparison. That's a huge gotcha. You'll make that mistake a bunch of times too. <clears throat> Ask 
ask me how I know this. So one of the things that's nice about this is that we can create functions. And the reason that we create a function is because we want um, to reuse this code. And yeah, you can copy and paste, right? But you really don't want to do that because it's ugly and it gets bulky and it's all the same thing. And it's much easier just to go, let's go give this a function. We'll give that function a name and then I'll just use that function. So this is kind of a two-step process. The first step is that we define the function. The second step is that we call it. So this is kind of like kids. You want your oldest son to go take the trash out, but they're all in there playing video games. You got to call the kid. Well, first you have to make the kid. Then you have to call the kid over and go, hey, go take the trash out. This is a third step there in that case, which is listen to them whine for the next five minutes because they don't want to take the trash out. But in functions, we just have the two steps. So here we're saying that we're going to have a function called some numbers. We have num1 and num2. I know very clever variable names here. And the result, and another variable called result, and it is what happens when we add num1 and num2 together. Really easy. The beauty of this is that I can pop in any numbers that I want. So I could go in in JavaScript and say, go add these two numbers together. Quite honestly, I do this all the time. I need to add something, or if I want to, if I need to do some math, I won't go open the calculator program in the in the computer. I'll go and have my term because I've got my terminal window open. I'll go to it, go to Node, and then type it in the, my math and let it do the math for me. I do this all the time. So I I can do that, but I want to keep reusing this because I don't want to do math a bunch. Let the computer do the math. So here we're going to put in the numbers five and eight. And when I do that, it's going to give me back 13 because last time I checked, 5 and 8 was 13. What if you didn't put in the numbers? What happens then? Well, it's going to yell at you. It's going to return NAN, which is short for not a number. All right. This means you got to put it, you, those arguments are required. You got to put them in. All right. So what if I put in the arguments sub and dude? Now, those aren't numbers. We know that. I know that. Not a math metal giant, even I know that. This is going to return sub dude because it doesn't know the difference. Now, if I was trying to multiply together, I would probably get not a number. But because I have plus, plus is join text together, it'll actually spit it out. The last example, I've got the number 10 in quotes, which makes it a string. A string, right? It makes it a string, not a number. And the other one is the number 10. Now, you and I know that that first one is a 10, and then it's supposed to be a number. But JavaScript doesn't know that. It's, its smartness only goes so far. So what it does is it treats it like a string, and it jams them together. So we get 10, 10 instead of 20. We have other types of functions. There are some that are anonymous functions where you have put in a function, and you didn't give it a name. This is, you know, this is just sort of a little one-off. I need to do this the one time and that's it. Um, you also have arrow functions. This is kind of the new school way of doing this. And yeah, this is really ugly and complicated. Don't worry about it. That's all for that. We've got JSON, JavaScript object notation. Sometimes we see things in this format. So we're doing an array here of objects and our object starts with that curly brace and then what we're doing is we're putting our keys name age and height in parentheses or in quotes double quotes they're separated by a colon and then we're putting in those values and after each one we we we, we end that with a comma and so it knows okay there's there's more to this so this is a list of students i have two students i have billy i have bob uh, if the height is in inches, Billy really needs to be playing basketball because uh, he's really tall. And if it's in centimeters, then Bob is really short. I didn't quite think that all the way through. Sometimes we see this as its own file, which is a .json file. 
All right, so this is what we have over here on the right, this data.json. And this is incredibly useful because JSON is used to move things in between applications, to move things between programs, a way of shuttling data back and forth. It's kind of like your, your inner office message courier. It's very, very useful. This is not the only way to do it. They can also do it with XML, but JSON is much easier. And MongoDB, which is a NoSQL database, uses a, a derivative of JSON to store all of its data. So this is incredibly useful to know, at least to get some familiarity with. Speaking of objects, objects. So the, here's the thing. Objects have properties, things about them, and they have methods, things that you can do with them. Well, those properties are just the attributes. So, you know, we may have a student. Uh, so here's our student, and we have one of those attributes might be what his name is, and another attribute might be what type of student is he? Is he an undergrad? That's what I am at the moment. Um, and what course is he currently taking? This is CS50. Um, that's actually offered at Harvard, by the way. It's an introductory to computer science, and it's supposed to be fabulous. I signed up for it once. I never did finish. But it's really good. It's exceptionally good. Then we have a method. What can our student do? Well, they can enroll in a class. All right, so now here is our method called enroll. And now here's my function that doesn't have a name because it doesn't really need one. And this is what it's going to do. And in this case, I'm just kind of wussing out here and doing a hi there, whatever the student's name is. And that's it. So if we want to use these, I can do student.enroll and it will spit out hi there whatever the student name is. And I can also pull that data and go, okay, well, what is, what is Billy's current course? So I can do that with student, because that's the name of the object, and then a dot, and then the attribute, which is current course. So this is really nice. When Billy passes CS50, go Billy, and he says, great, I want to enroll in another class. I wonder, this was a lot of fun. I'm going to enroll in CS100. Okay, cool, you can do that. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to say student.current course equals CS100, and it'll update that object. So really, really useful. We have classes. Now, a class is not an object. Class deals with objects, it uses objects, but it is not an object. It is simply a template for these JavaScript objects. So we have an example here for car. We're going to use the keyword class. For our naming convention, we do want classes to be to start with a capital letter. For our variables, we generally want those to start with a lowercase character, but classes, we want them to start with an uppercase character. It kind of helps solidify what's what. Um, that's just part of the kind of naming convention. It's not really syntax, but it's, it's, it's kind of related. So we have a keyword constructor, and we're using these things, name and year. And then we've got this keyword this. And then to use it, we just say, hey, I've got a new variable called my car one and my car one is equal to a new car, a new car object, and it's got Ford and it's 2014. And if we want to view our objects, we go over to our trusty console.log and go view my car one, and it's going to spit out a Ford 2014. Pretty cool. We have events. We said that JavaScript lets the user interact with the page. It does so with events. So one of the events that I had, this was the event that I showed you at the very beginning. For click me, what it does is it says, hey, document object model, that thing at window, at this location, I want you to run the reload method. I want you to refresh. And that's what it does. And that's why it kept coming up and refreshing so that I don't have to. I actually use this. I ripped this right out of a Flask application that I wrote, um, which Flask is a Python mini framework. But 
I wanted to refresh the page with a button that says make another suggestion because it's a suggestion app. And so I just keep clicking that button until something strikes my fancy. And then I'm like, cool, that's what I'm having for supper tonight. So, but this is literally the code that I use, the JavaScript code that I had that Python app return. So a practical example of this, because this is a very, very simple event, but a practical example would be, hey, let's go validate a form field, right? I want to make sure they actually put something in. So if you have required fields, this is a way to verify that those fields are actually contain something and that they contain the right something in some cases. In this case, we're just making sure that the field is not empty. So we're going to say in our form over here, we've got a, a, a label here for name and the ID is your name. And then what we're going to do is say variable A is whatever the value of your name is. And if A is equal to just an open and close quotes, meaning it's an empty string, or, see there's our or, or it's null, meaning the user just skipped right past and didn't put anything in. Okay, well, if that's the case, then throw up an alert, it's a good use for an alert, and say, hey, please enter a name. And then go shift the focus back onto your name. So focus is another one of our events that we can do. And this is just a small list. We've got mouse over, mouse down. We've got focus, which element has, has the attention on the page. Uh, we've got load. So on page loads, you can have it run some JavaScript code. You can have it select things. If the user selects this radio button or whatever. So all sorts of things that you can do. And then the, the submit actually kicks it off. So when they go click the validate form button, what it does is it goes in and submits this and it checks it. So this is pretty cool. Some of the resources for this, uh, this is just some of the ones that I, that I use for this, some interesting things. The big one is at the bottom here, and that's where you can find this presentation and all of the source code that I listed in there. By the way, in some of the code samples, there's additional things in there. Additional experimentation that I did, and all of it works. So it should run without any problems. Feel free to experiment with it, play around with it. But that's where you can go and, and find it. But it is at uh, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash github.com slash BKV speaks. And then you'll see this, this is all the code samples for all of the talks that I've given, you'll see one that says intro to JavaScript, and that is this. So any questions on what we talked about tonight? I know it's a lot, and if your head hurts, it's okay. Other events, you had a list of what the other events were, mm -hmm. like mouse over? Yes. Et cetera, a type of event, or you see there's more than I can do? Just, here. yeah, there's a good question. There's more types of events, et cetera, is not one of those events. Okay. It's just, there, there's much, much more. This, this is just a short list of, of events. And in fact, I think I listed out what the events were. Uh, did I? Oh, I didn't. Okay. Oh, shame on me. Okay. Oh, well. Yeah, so no, no. Et cetera is not another event type. But this is where the, this is where the code sample is. And so if we go back to the browser, we'd actually see that event in action, which is kind of cool. If this will let me do it real quick. Oh, wrong browser. Okay, so here is our event. And the code for this has an event that if they click it, it reloads. I added another event that says, if we mouse over it, change the color. We're changing it either from green or Rebecca purple. And if you want a real tear jerker of a story, go look up how that color, that CSS color got its name. What color is it? It's Rebecca Purple. You don't need a box of tissues, so though, I promise. So this event, when I click it, it takes what was, this is HTML. It does all of our hellos. 
and it changes it to this is JavaScript. So that's pretty cool. Uh, if I change this to, well, I have one other HTML file in the code, and that is form. And so this is kind of cool. So we've got plain HTML right here, and then I've got a, a couple of paragraph tags that say this is P1 and P2. And this button here is going to go get values for P1 and P2. And it's basically, it's going to go replace this is P1 with this is paragraph one. It's a fine thing to blah, 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 right? The other one is five o'clock somewhere. I can clear those values too. So if you have people doing a form, you may want a clear button that clears the form values out so that you don't get other people's data in there. And so that just wipes everything else out. Now, if I go to validate, it's going to yell at me and say, hey, you got to enter a name. Because that's what I told it to do. And it called focus over to name. So if I put in a name, I like Billy, and I click on validate, it's like, mm, yeah, Sparky, you also need, you owe me an email address too. Right? Well, this is very, very simple validation because it doesn't, it doesn't check to see if what I put in here is in the right format. It doesn't check that at all. You can make it do that, but I just chose not to. And then I went and used those values and had it say, hey, you submitted this and this. So this is kind of the way we can do this is some of the things that we can do with, uh, with events. Uh, we seem to have an error here. Character encoding was, uh, oh, okay. So this is yelling at me because I didn't tell it what type of text characters the HTML document consisted of. And so that's fine. This is inform.html. That's fine. That's okay. Sometimes it'll tell you, hey, you gave me this and I was expecting this. And by the way, in this file, on this line, at this character is where I was expecting this. So your console here, your developer tools, is really, really useful stuff. Because you can actually go and see when you make a mistake. It'll kind of point you in the general direction. It won't solve the problem for you, but it's it's really kind of useful. Especially if you if you leave off a semicolon or you tack on a, a comma at the end of something, or you had two commas, or you did a curly, you did a parenthesis instead of a curly brace, whatever. So this will this will tell you. The error messages in your console will tell you. So this is this is useful. And you can do the console.log to go throw values in here when you're troubleshooting your web application. And you may want to remove them out, but this will help you see, okay, this is what it is at this stage. And it's this, and it's this, and it's this, and wait, why is it this? It's not supposed to be this. So it's really kind of useful. When you push it to production, you should probably go remove all those console.logs, but the users are never going to see this unless they're nosy like me. And right click, inspect element, and then pull up the console. So there you go. So that is... Uh, that's it. So if there's no other questions. Um, I have oh, a question. I have a question, yes. So these are some really great resources to get started in. But what would you recommend locally? Are there some resources here in town? I know Codecast is a great place to meet sure. all developers, but what have you seen that is a great place to start? As well as if you were just getting going, where would you recommend to start with this list? Oh, oh that's, a, that's a great question. If you want to take a class, there's a bunch of online resources available. If online is not your thing, uh, I used to work at Computer Tutors. Um, it's actually two different stints there, and, and he's got a really good JavaScript course, as well as some other courses. Now, it doesn't quite go as far as it should, but for a starting point, it's a really good starting point. Uh, if you're not more of a, I want to have somebody sit there and yammer away at me, then and you're more like, a, I like a book. I love this book. In fact, I brought this book to work specifically to go showcase this. This is a, an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous book that shows you, let me see. Well, let's go to 
functions. So it shows you the function and it explains what each section of it does. And that's just for functions. And like this is for every bit of this. And it says on script and jQuery because jQuery is pretty ubiquitous. Um, I think the actual thing is, the actual title is the JavaScript book, but in I always refer to it as the diamond book because of the diamond shape on the cover. But this is phenomenal. Also, if you're trying to figure out where this HTML and CSS stuff is that I was talking about, they have a book on that as well, same publisher, and it is amazing. I wish that I had this book when I started. Um, and I have, um, yeah, there's another book series that's also good. I like using at least two, just because sometimes there'll be something in one that's not in another. And another book series that I like for this is the Maroc series. It's a big blue book, kind of yellow writing on the cover, M-U-R-A-C-H. They have a bunch of books on programming stuff, and they have one on JavaScript and jQuery as well. What I like about that book series is they will explain the concept on the left-hand side when you've got the book folded up on the desk, and then they'll give you the code sample on the right-hand side. So this is really useful because while they do a little bit of repetition, it's really more useful when you can't quite remember exactly what the formatting is for JSON. And now you got to write a little piece of JSON, right? You can flip to that page with JSON. You don't need the concepts. I just need to see what it looks like. And that's on the right hand side always. So the book is twice as thick. I mean, you kill somebody with it, but it is a really good book series. And I have just about run the category. I think I've got every book that they've gotten except maybe three. And in some cases, like I bought two different versions of the PHP and MySQL book when they when they upgraded. They went from PHP five to PHP seven. I bought the new book, so that's that's another good book series. But I love if you can only do one, this Diamond book for JavaScript and jQuery. These guys have got it going on. This is probably the best book ever because this explains things in such a down to earth method. Uh, like I say, class-wise, uh, locally, computer tutors is great. Uh, I'm actually working on building out a, a bigger four-length course on this that is going to be available online at some point, um, along with an HTML course. The HTML course is going to be free for, for mine. The CSS and JavaScript, the, the remainders will, will not be, but very reasonably priced. Um, and I've actually used some other online resources as well. Um, LinkedIn Learning is really good. That's, I've used that. Plural Site's really good if you don't want to buy into the Microsoft thing because they bought LinkedIn. But, but Plural Site's good as well. I've paid for both of those. So those are really good. Um, for strictly front end stuff, frontendmasters.com is amazing. They have just about everything. They are phenomenal. But it's only front end stuff. So you're, you won't see any Python code, you won't see any PHP, you won't see any C sharp or anything like that. You, you're just going to get front end related things. So lots of JavaScript, lots of JavaScript libraries and frameworks, really top notch stuff, very cutting edge. It's a little pricey, but for the year, it's, it's really good. Any other questions? Are you familiar with MIT's open courses? Yes. Yes, I've signed up for a whole slew of those and never managed to complete any of them. That's why I, was, that's why I knew about CS50. I still want to go do it just so that I can buy the t-shirt, honestly. <laughs> now, they're open courses. The edX stuff, I actually have a subscription to Coursera that gives me access to everything that they've got. So they, get, they do the same thing that edX does, where you get access to college-level courses. Um, you don't get anything official because you know that that costs. <laughs> as a current college and student, as a current college student enrolled at Western Governors University, let me tell you, they they're, they're going to get their cash. Um, but you can get the the education for for free or or next to nothing if you do a, a lot of them. 
I, I went ahead and paid for it because I want the actual certificate. There's a, a, several different programs there that I'm, that I'm going through, that I'm doing, but. Are you familiar with some of the free digits that Google offers? Yes. As well as some of the programs. Some, a lot of them are ending now that we're coming out of the pandemic, but a lot of these programs like Coursera are offering right. free certification. Sure. Actually, that's why, it's funny you mentioned that, that's why I bought the Coursera subscription was because of a Google certification on uh, data analysis. And they had two different versions. Coursera had the Google certification and then it was one by IBM. And they, they both covered the same thing, but they used different technology stacks to do it with. And so I, I signed up to do that and then I decided I didn't want to be a data analyst anymore. But there was other things, product management stuff that I that I had started once before and was paying for, and and I'm continuing to do so. Now, so it's really good. There's lots of resources. We we do not suffer from a lack of resources. That's for sure. There is a plethora of them, but but I have a ton of books, and some are better than others. I love this diamond book. I like the Barack book. The O'Reilly books are. Okay, I mean, this, it, it depends. It depends. But those two series, I really, I, I really like the way that they do their their stuff. It's laid out really well, or it's, it's incredibly pretty, or both. So, cool. Well, I appreciate you guys coming out, and spending a little bit of time with me this evening, and uh, and hopefully I'll see you again in another one of these. I have a couple of other discussions that I've done before on intro to Python. So if you want to know more about Python, I've got a presentation already prepared for that. I'm not going to do it tonight, though, because my voice is tired. Uh, and I've also done one on intro to Git, which is version control, which is one of those things that they don't teach you about in a lot of these other resources. So, uh, but that is a very, very useful developer tool. So I've got a, a slide deck on that. Also one on Python, uh, an introduction to Python web programming. So I cover some of the some of the things there. So, all right. Well, I appreciate you coming out. Sneak it right on the webcam. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Everybody on the live. We do these every second Thursday of the month, and we'd love to see you here next week, uh, month for some free pizza. If you want to come out, as well as online, make you again. <laughs>